Hello there, and welcome back to another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with is Matt Wicks. So, Matt, can you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, um, thanks for having me back. And so for those of you who didn't see um, the first episode with me, I've been involved in K-12 through online learning for a little over 20 years now. Um, I began as part of the group that created the Illinois Virtual High School, Illinois State Supplemental Program, and um, served as the director of that program for many years. Um, after I ended my involvement with um, that program, I had my own consulting company for K-12 online learning. I had a stint with INAC Hall, um, now the Aurora Institute, as their chief operating officer. And for the past six and a half years, I've been with Pearson um, supporting the Connections Academy schools that are currently in 27 states. And my emphasis these days is how to help those schools perform effectively on state accountability measures. Now, Matt, I know over the years you've held a number of leadership positions, both in brick and mortar and in online environments. And as you think through what's happening right now and how this school year is ending and the impact that it might have on how the next school year starts, what advice would you have for school leaders in thinking those issues through? So I, I think you need to... Uh kind of separate out the end of this year versus the beginning of next year, because I, I just think there's different things that you need to be thinking about. So I'll start with about the end of this year. Um, first of all, I would start out by celebrating. This has been a difficult um, situation, depending on how much planning your school had in, how quickly this um, happened in your area, you may have had very little time. And while things may have not always gone as smoothly as you had hoped or wanted, there certainly is something in there that you can be happy about how it went, whether it's how students pulled on together, um, how the you know teachers came together and were able to um, come up with solutions um, quickly. And so I think take some time to celebrate, especially let uh, the teachers and the students know that you appreciate, um, you know, the, the work um, that they did. Um, so having done that celebration, I think the second thing I would do is take a look at the gaps between what you had hoped to deliver and what you did deliver and the gaps between maybe the expectations that people had, whether that's parents or students, and what you uh, were able to deliver. And just because there's a gap there doesn't necessarily mean that you as a school leader of the school um, is in the wrong or isn't doing enough. It might be the expectation is unrealistic. If you know the expectation was everything should be synchronous, that's probably not the best way. In fact, I'll go strongly, stronger than probably. That isn't the best way to conduct online learning. But understanding those differences can be key because if your families are expecting one thing and your plans are something different, if you haven't communicated that clearly, then you're going to have that disconnect with that. Um, I think another thing that you need to... Um, think about are what are the things that are kind of unusual, you know, whether it be an exception that your State Department of Education or the federal government um, put in place that you now need to adjust for. For example, we know no one had state assessments. Um, are there aspects in your system where you actually use that data to make decisions on how students get placed or what interventions they might um, um, need to be receiving for the next year. So what are you going to do in the absence of that data? Um, perhaps your state has said you can go to a pass-fail. What does that mean for how GPA is calculated? So you just, there's a variety of operational issues that don't normally occur that are occurring this year that you need to think about. And then finally, um, as far as the end of this year, I'd be thinking about what are you going to do this summer 
uh, if anything, as far as providing learning opportunities for students. Clearly, there's going to be planning activities going on for next year, but do you want to have summer school offerings? Do you want them to be different than they would typically be if you normally have summer school offerings? For example, would the summer school offerings perhaps focus on allowing students extra time to complete a course or to address other learning gaps. And that leads very naturally in to um, planning for next year. Um, the reality, is, I mean, there's always students that come in at the beginning of the year with some sort of learning gaps. But for next year, you have to assume that they are going to be larger and there's going to be a wider variety than normal. Um, especially if you get students transferring in to your school, who knows you know, what their situation was from whatever school that they came from. So you need to think about, are there formative pre-tests um, that you want to use in a greater way? Maybe you already use something like NWE map or Scantron performance series, or there's other assessments out there, but do you want to use that in a greater manner to inform yourself on how you're going to be able to personalize the program for the students? Because it's, it's not going to be a typical year. All right. Perfect. So I guess thinking ahead to next year as well, beyond just the beginning of the school year, you know, one of the things that we know about pandemics is there's often multiple waves of them. As society starts to reopen in various sectors, there could be local flare-ups that happen in different areas. So individual districts may have to, to close down. What sort of things should school leaders be thinking about and, and doing at this point that might help make the transition to a remote environment next year a little more seamless than what we had this year. Right. And I think the expectation should be that you're going to have to be remote at least part of next year. You don't know if that's going to be at the beginning, if it's going to be delayed, if there's going to be a flare up. But as an educational leader, if you're not prepared for that happening, you really haven't done your job. And we'd all celebrate if that ends up not being necessary at all, but you need to be prepared. And the stakes are gonna be higher for you as an educational leader. I think for a large degree, schools were given a certain degree of, okay, this came out of nowhere. Um, you couldn't possibly be prepared. And schools, I think, in many ways did a great job, but I think the expectations are, okay, that was your your beta test or your dry run, uh, and now we expect you to be ready. And that may not really be a reasonable expectation, but I think the expectation is going um, to be there. So I think you want to focus on the summer of planning for different scenarios, asking the question, should I build more blended learning in because that will be easier to transition to a remote environment. That would be one thing that I would really look at. Trying to create your physical classroom and curriculum presentation in a way that is very well suited to immediately transfer um, to online. And to me, um, I'll you know, I'm using the term blended learning, which uh, has a lot of different meanings um, to different people. And I, I don't want to get bogged down on exactly what that means, but I think it's really the, the use of your electronic system so that, first of all, students are already familiar with that. So it's not like teaching, um, you know, those systems, but um, it just becomes easier to transition. But one part of transitioning that obviously has to be taken into account is access issues. Um, I think one thing that this pandemic has shown um, is that there's not equity of access across all communities. And so you can't place an expectation on students to be online if they don't have the basic equipment and connectivity. So those aren't 
um, easy problems to solve, but that, that needs to be part of your planning process. And as you're getting money from CARES, I would definitely prioritize money in that way because, like I said, that, that's the base level. If you don't have the access, if you don't have the connectivity, then nothing else really can matter. Um, obviously, in the end, it's the curriculum, it's the pedagogy that's most important, but it has to have that foundation for that um, to be something that you can do. All right. Thank you very much, Matt. This has been another edition of Five Minutes on K-12 Online Learning with, and today our with has been Matt Wicks. Thank you very much.